this is Paula from Sentimental by Nature. I'm going to be doing a series of drawing and watercolor videos and art journaling videos, uh, lessons and tutorials and whatnot. So I thought I would um, do a video uh, explaining the materials that you might need and the ones that I use. So make, make it a little easier for you to um, follow along and give you a little bit of time to get some materials together. So uh, let's get into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is brushes. You're going to need a flat and I believe this one is a quarter, uh, maybe a half inch, five eighths, I'm not sure, um, brush. And just a flat brush. It, it could be synthetic or anything. This is basically primarily used for wetting your paper if you're going to do washes. So like think sunsets and that kind of thing. Um, you're also going to need somewhere around a number six and somewhere around a number two round brush. Now, these are the brushes I use the most. I mean, these are on my desk and in my travel kit at all times. These are my favorites. Uh, this is a Utrecht number six round uh, red sable. This is a Cotman, uh, which is the Winsor Newton student line, which is a synthetic number two. Um, generally in my kit because I do botanicals and I need fine lines I will also have a one and a zero Kolinsky sable round for veins and fi very fine detail but I've also got a number three Robert Simmons synthetic so and I have a number four Cotman synthetic that I use a lot. So this is my basic brushes, although I have a ton of brushes because over the years you accumulate a ton. But I would say you would want somewhere, one, one round somewhere around a six and one somewhere around a two. With those three starting out in watercolor, generally speaking, these three will get you through the watercolor 101 type classes. So these definitely are necessary. So I'm going to set those over here. Now for drawing, uh, for drawing and um, watercolor, any pencil you put down on your paper, once you put watercolor over it, it is permanent. It will, it really will not erase. So um, really draw lightly and I, I just like cheap mechanical pencils is what I use. They're very inexpensive. I just pick them up at whatever store multi-packs for as cheaply as possible. A lot of people like using regular pencils. That's fine. If you're using a regular pencil, you will need some sort of sharpener. This is a portable electric sharpener. This is a standard sharpener and this is a standard sharpener with a little case so you can hold your shavings. Um, if you're going to use a traditional pencil, you will need one of these. So, I prefer a kneaded eraser. Um, to get a clean spot, you just stretch it, turn it, and you have a clean spot so you don't smudge your paper. There are other types of eraser. There's white plastic eraser, and there's um, art gum erasers. I don't like these on watercolor paper. Um, if you get too aggressive or they have any any dirt on them, they can smudge your paper. They can also alter the texture surface of your paper so that the paint doesn't lay down. So I don't really like these. This does not do that in any way, shape, or form. So our, the, the, the kneaded eraser is my preferred and one, my recommended. So one of these, cheap mechanical pencil. Now what these are are Micron pens. I prefer Micron. Some people use the Ultra Fine Sharpie but I would recommend th these all are waterproof so you can paint over them and they won't bleed so I I prefer the microns and you can get them in different widths the 005 is very very thin and the 05 is thicker um, your choice just choose one and a waterproof pen so that you can put black ink marks onto your piece now water source big big jar for your dirty water. You want as much water as possible. Change it as frequently as possible. Um, 
because the dirtier that your brushes are and the dirtier water is, it will muddy your paints and your painting. Then a source of clean water, so you would clean your brushes here, and you have a choice. You can use a sponge, you can use tissue, you can use an old washcloth, you could even use paper towel. So the procedure would be to clean your brushes would be dirty water, dab it off on one of these things, and then pick up your clean water and go back into your palette to paint. That will keep your colors the brightest. If you're traveling on the go, this is an amazing little thing. It's I think I might maybe spent two three dollars on it. So you have dirty water, clean water, and you could you know just have paper towel. And this is a nice little travel thing. So um, but water is important. So these are all water containers uh, and ways to clean your brush. Like I said, very very simple stuff here. Now, here's another source of water spray. You can spray your palette to re-wet it. You can use a dropper to drop water into your palette to, to re-wet it. Uh, so another source of water, because water being our, our media, our, our focal point of our medium. We're going to talk about paper. And this is, um, I, I like Fabriano. Um, this is Fabriano's uh, Studio Watercolors, 140 pounds. That's the thickness of it. So it's a very thick piece of paper. You can add a lot of water to it before it starts buckling. Um, paper is important. Paper, paper really will make or break your, your painting. Uh, if you use really inexpensive, cheap paper, or like, you know, uh, copy paper, it's going to buckle and wrinkle and run and just be absolutely unpredictable. Watercolor paper is a must, so some sort of watercolor paper. Like I said, this is the studio watercolor, 50 sheets. I I know I didn't spend more than 20 bucks on this, uh, so it, pretty inexpensive, 50 sheets of paper. And it has a smoother side and a rougher side, so you have a little bit of variety there. Another um, easy to find brand is um, Arches Paper, and they also come in a block and a block is got adhesive all the way around you. You can paint right on it. It stretches and holds your paper. Um, and then when you're done with the painting, you just take a palette knife and cut it off. Very convenient, very portable, um, and available in cold or hot press. Cold press is a rougher texture. Hot press is a smoother texture. And there's different reasons to use both. Um, you want more detail in your painting. As like botanical illustration, you want a smoother paper, you want um, maybe a landscape, something where you get a lot of texture and, and rocks and trees and leaves and, and you want a rougher texture, um, then you go with a cold press. And this is actually cold press, but it's got a, a smoother side and a rougher side, so it's it's kind of nice. It's it's kind of versatile, and I do recommend this one um, or, the, or one of the arches. Now, if you're using sheets like this, you need to put them on a board. And I use just cheap, regular clipboards or pieces of foam board. And what you do with that is you take some sort of a masking tape. This is regular masking tape, and this is paint tape or artist tape. They both are pretty low tack, which means they won't leave a residue on their on your paper, hopefully, um, or tear your paper when you're when you're pulling it up. But you just tape your paper down like that. So you do it at the top, at the bottom, and at the sides. You tape your paper down and seal it in, um, and then begin your painting. It'll hold it in place. It'll keep it from buckling. And um, I work on multiple paintings at a time, so this is what I use in the studio are these. So this would have a painting. This would have a painting. You have to wait in between to make sure that they are um, drying before you go into the next step. So I'll work on maybe, you know, anywhere from two to ten different paintings at a time. And then clipboards I use in the studio sometimes, but I really use these um, when I'm painting outside the studio. So, alrighty, so then we're going to move along to paint. Paint comes, watercolor paint comes in this format. It comes in these little blocks, in pans, or it comes in tubes. So you're going to see these three are gouache. Um, but the difference between gouache and watercolor proper is gouache is opaque, and watercolor is transparent in general. Um, you see permanent white, and then I have a gold and a silver because I do a lot of calligraphy, and I can I can actually um, 
watered down watercolor paint and gouache and use it in a dip uh, fountain type pen and do calligraphy with it, which most people don't realize. But um, so I use these um, pretty extensively. So these these are the types, and I've got Grumbacher and Cotman, which is a Winsor Newton student quality. It's an old Cotman. I, I do have some Daniel Smith. This is uh, Schmenke, which is a German brand, which their metallics are just phenomenal. They're the best uh, in metallics, so I use Schmenke in that. Um, but this is what they look like. This is how they come. So uh, my recommendation is actually only six tubes. So all you're going to need is six tubes of watercolor. And what you see here is a, this is the cool colors. And this is the warm colors that I recommend. Um, so basically you are, this one is lemon yellow hue and this is the Cotman variety you have permanent rose and ultramarine these are your cool color palette now in the warm color palette you have cadmium red deep hue and a color called gamboge hue and the oh there it is the blue is intense blue now you can kind of see from these little let me bring these up a second these are little swatches of them running into each other in the different colors that you can make and it's the camera's not really picking them up that well so I'm gonna show you this this is a future project Six tubes of paint. The Cotman is the Winsor Newton student variety of a uh, uh, brand line. They run somewhere between uh, somewhere around three dollars a tube, I believe, at this time. So um, they're very inexpensive. You only will really need six tubes. This color palette is from those six tubes. You see, lemon yellow, gamboge, permanent rose, cadmium red ultramarine and intense blue. So this is one of the projects that we're going to be doing with these colors showing you just the amount of variety those six tubes will get you and why we have a cool and why we have a warm uh, choice here. So those are the colors that you can make. So I'm going to take these away real quick because now we're going to talk about palettes. So palettes you can get as expensive, there are, there are palettes out there that are hundreds of dollars, <laughs> Seri literally hundreds of dollars, and there's some palettes out there that are a dollar or less. These two here are the dollar less palettes. There's two varieties of them. There's another variety. Sorry, I forgot to grab one. And it is this one. So, all of these can be had for less than two dollars, I believe, actually less than a dollar. You've got this one. I like this one because it has a lot of wells. It's got big mixing space. Um, this is if if you have the room in your area, I recommend this one. Got a lot more room to work, a lot more area to mix. Now, these guys, not much room to work, not much room to mix. This one has a little bit more but they are very inexpensive. Now plastic, the one thing about plastic, you have to pre-treat them or see how this lays across and you can see what color it truly is. Same way with this one and the same way with that one. But some of them are beaded up. Now, you take a, a, a just a regular dish scrubby and you scrub these plastic surfaces, it roughs the, it up just enough that it doesn't bead up and if if your palettes are beading up, you cannot see truly what color you're blending. You want them to spread. You you want them to to pull out, not pop, uh, pull up into droplets. So if they're still pulling, if they're still beading up, rub them with you know like one of your Teflon safe um, scrubby pads. It takes a little bit of that smoothness away and allows the paint to spread. Um, 
Now, if you have a metal palette or an enameled palette, it doesn't do that. And this, this palette is actually set up with those three colors. So it's ready to go um, for the, the lessons. Now, there are, of course, large palettes. Um, I don't have one here right now for you uh, to show you, but large um, palettes that you use within the, the studio that has lots of colors. And we're not going to worry about that. I think that's confusing. Now, Winston & Newton has some... Um, the Cotman and the Professional Artist line of travel palettes, and you get a little, you actually get a number two Cotman paintbrush with the pa the palette. Oh, you really have to be careful with these caps because you do not want to damage the bristles. Put them back in anyway. So um, my problem with uh, this one is it doesn't have the colors that I recommend. I've actually replaced some of it, but these are the pans. These are the what I've been saying is. Um, these little white pans that these are half pans and full pans are double size um, but it's one of the ways that watercolor comes in but this is the Cotman uh, you know already have paint in it travel palettes and you can make your own and this is a little bit of variety this is a believe it or not it's a cigarette container and this is an Altoids tin and this is an Altoids tin but you can put Fimo or whatever type of polymer clay in the palette, in, into the bottom, make wells and fill them with color. And this is this is the one that's in my travel kit at all times. And you can see I notated this is lemon, this is cadmium yellow, gamboge. And I also have these um, letter and numbers here, um, PY175. That is the actual pigment in that brand's paint. So I know exactly what I'm using um, because these different pigments have different characteristics and different tendencies to, to how they flow on paper so I actually note that on my palettes um, here's another palette with some different colors that I don't use as commonly and yet another one so um, you might want to make your palette this and then use a white plate as your mixing palette just a white ceramic plate so you can see your colors. You don't really want to use a color behind on your palette. But a white a, a white plate is one of the best mixing palettes. It's easy to clean, it won't stain. You have it around the house. And then you can use these and use that as your mixing palette or something like that. So now you have a choice of palettes, you have a choice of couple of things but this I'm gonna set you up what I think your basic kit should be you need a secure surface of some sort so you need some sort of board for your paper to be taped to you need paper All right so your boards if you buy a piece of foam core that foam board at the craft store it's like a dollar. Uh, actually, these are even, the clipboards are even only a dollar. Um, paper, hopefully you'll spend less than $20. Brushes, you could probably get away with uh, 10 to $15 in brushes. You probably have a pencil, you may have an eraser, and you may even have a pen lying around the house. Tissues, paper towel, or a washcloth. Simple as that for uh, cleaning your brushes. A glass, a cup, a an old yogurt tub for water, some sort of low tack tape in the in the um, masking tape range, and then a palette of some sort that you prefer. I prefer ones with lids. I have cats and I get cat hair in everything if I don't have um, a cover for them. My cats are into everything and their hair gets into everything. And so our that's four tubes. I'm missing two tubes. And and so this is your basic kit. So six tubes of a warm and a cool of red, yellow, and blue. 
and I gave you the um, the Cotman student names for those. A pellet of some sort. A waterproof pen, preferably archival, no acid. Some sort of a pencil. A kneaded eraser. Masking tape. Some sort of cloth or paper to remove the color from your brush. Some sort of a water tub. Three brushes flat, somewhere around a number six and somewhere around a number two. Paper, I would recommend 140 pounds or above, cold press or hot press. Um, my two preferred are Fabriano or Arches. And some sort of a board to tape your paper to if you are not using a watercolor block. So that is your basic watercolor kit and um, this is a, a pretty small grouping of items. You could see it would fit in a very, very small space. Um, a thin tote bag would hold it. Uh, with a, a little accessory bag for these items. Uh, you do want to protect your brushes in some way. Uh, they A lot of times they come with a little plastic cover. Just be really careful you don't damage the bristles putting the little cover back on them. But this is all you need. So get your materials together and we will see each other soon and start taking some steps in learning how to move this paint around. Thank you and please like and subscribe. And have a good day.